But I want to begin today by talking about disease. A really fun topic to start with, right? It's not like we've heard much about disease on the news or in everyday conversation for the last couple of years. In fact, I think over the last couple of years, most of us have had our high school biology class refreshed when it comes to disease and what causes disease. And diseases, as we know, are caused by bacteria or viruses that enter our bodies through some membrane of our body, most usually our nose or our mouth. And these are microscopic life forms that multiply inside our bodies and make us sick. But if they're microscopic, how do we know we have the disease? We can't possibly see those minuscule life forms entering our bodies. So how do we find out if we have them inside of us? One word. Symptoms. It's a good word to say. Symptoms. Think back to the last time you were sick. What were some of the symptoms that you had? Maybe you had a, a runny nose or a cough. In fact, both of those, a runny nose and a cough, are ways that your body uses to expel the bacteria and virus microbes that are causing the disease. When you have a runny nose, it's your body trying to flush out the germs from your sinuses. Did you know, this is what I learned this week, I thought I'd share, fun fact, did you know that the medical term for a runny nose is rhinorrhea? Like <laughs> diarrhea, but rhinorrhea. I learned that this week and I thought I'd share it with you all as your fun fact for the morning. You're welcome. If you have gastrovirus or infection, you may throw up, throw up or have other ejections from parts of your body. Again, this is the body trying to flush out the infection. I told you it's a, a disease type sermon this morning. Even a fever is designed to create an unpleasant environment for the virus or bacteria to grow in and also kicks your immune system into gear. But all of these things are symptoms. These are your body's way of fighting the disease. They are not the disease themselves. But the symptoms tell you that you have a disease. They are an indicator that those microscopic virus or bacteria cells are active in our bodies, even though we cannot see them. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, we all have a disease that we call sin. It's a heart condition that we can't physically see the cause of, but we see the symptoms of it all around us. When we think of sin, we most often think of the sinful acts that we do or the sinful words that we say. We think of gossip or adultery. We think of yelling or stealing. But these aren't actually the, the, the disease of sin. These are only the symptoms the core of our sin problem, the actual root of our disease in our lives goes much deeper and is a lot harder to see and to root out. And as we dig further into the book of Amos today, we are going to see this prophet of God point a spiritual microscope onto the people of Israel, onto their heart, to show them the root core of their problem. Well, last week we began going through a new book of the Bible, a book of the minor prophet called Amos. And this series is called Mining the Prophets, where we look at one of the minor prophet books of the Old Testament and try to mine all of the treasures that we can out of it and see how it points us to the gospel message of Jesus. But these books can be a little bit tricky. We often skip over them in our Bibles because they're packed full of obscure poetry and deal with life and situations from a, a different time and a different culture. They seem to assume a lot of foreknowledge and ultimately they don't give us the most attractive view of God, at least at face value. And so the goal of this series, like when we did this series last summer and looked at a couple of other minor prophet books, is to equip ourselves with a set of tools to help you mine these books for yourselves if you were to read them on your own. And here are the five tools that we've laid out. We need to understand the role of the prophet. We need to see the prophets as poets. We need to think in oracles. We need to remember context, context, context. And we need to look for keywords. And last week, we spent time looking at the context, context, context of what was going on in the days of Amos and to what situation he was writing to. So if you weren't with us last week, I encourage you to go, go back and listen, to open up the app maybe one day this week, maybe on your drive to work or while you're doing some chores, and listen to last week's message to get a bit of that context. And we're going to unpack each of these tools during this series as we need them. 
But this week, the tool that is going to be most helpful to us is in clearly understanding the role of the prophet. Now, when we think of the word prophet, we often think um, of someone who predicts the future. We picture them having these visions from God of what the distant future holds, and then they announce it to the people, often in devastating terms. And if this is how we view the prophets, then we're going to find ourselves confused when reading them. We're going to be looking at the events they described and the poetic terms they use, and we're going to constantly be trying to understand what in the future they're referring to. But although the prophets occasionally spoke of events of the distant future, their main role was to address the events in their own day, that were events that were currently happening. And their primary role was to interpret those events in light of the covenant. And in case you don't know, the covenant is a name for the relationship agreement between God and the people of Israel. In a covenant relationship, both parties make commitments like the vows on a wedding day. And in the covenant, God made promises to the people and he listed out stipulations for them to follow and how they could repair things if they broke those stipulations. And the covenant listed a bunch of different blessings that God would pour out on the people if they were to be true to this covenant. But it also listed a series of curses that God would send on the people if they wouldn't keep the terms of the covenant. And the role of the prophets was to interpret the events of their day in light of the covenant. In other words, the prophets were covenant commentators, covenant commentators. If you remember one thing about the role of the prophets, it's that they were covenant commentators. And we're going to see Amos exercise this role in the section of his prophecy that we're going to read today. If you were with us last week, then you'll remember that we looked at a series of poems of judgment that God spoke against the nations around Israel. And in the order that they were listed, he set up a geographical bullseye that put the nation of Israel right in the crosshairs of his judgment. And we saw that the judgment of Israel was much longer and went into much more detail as to their specific sins. And that's because they were God's people. God had been with them. He had rescued them. He had given them his laws to follow. He had given them, given them godly leaders to follow. But yet they still rejected him and tried to live their own way. And for the rest of the book of Amos, we are going to see these accusations, these accusations against Israel expounded upon and amplified. There is no other mention of judgment against any other nation. The target of God's judgment is firmly fixed on Israel. Uh, last week, I pointed out that in the seat backs in front of you, you should see one of our Mining the Prophet guides book, back guidebooks. If you didn't grab one last week, please grab one today. Um, or if you forgot to bring yours with you this morning, feel free to grab one to look at. This is for the whole series. It's got sermon outlines and notes for uh, the entire series in there. Today, we're going to be on page eight, I believe. Uh, but if you look to page, the, page two where you'll see this roadmap of the book of Amos. And the roadmap begins with the judgment poems against the nations in the first two chapters. And then the next uh, three chapters, we get these three judgment speeches against Israel. Each one begins with a call to attention. And they are designed to laser focus in on the sins of Israel and God's promised consequences against them. But remember that God's judgment isn't some out-of-control, angry rage of God. God's judgment is a holy judgment and a just judgment, yes. But it's also a patient judgment and a merciful judgment. And we're going to see that clearly today because we are going to look at two different types of God's judgment. And in doing so, my hope is that again, our view of God's judgment will be shaped by God's word rather than mi the misunderstanding that the world and sometimes the church has. But before we look at these two different types of judgment, we are going to look at the cause of God's judgment. And that's our first point if you're following along in the notes, the cause of God's judgment. This is essential for us to understand because not only... Does it help us to understand the judgment that's coming against Israel? But it's also crucial to our own discipleship because I think we might be guilty of the same thing. 
Uh, so if you have a Bible with you, then I encourage you to turn with me to Amos chapter 3. You can use a paper Bible, or you can op- pull out your smartphone or smart device if you've got a Bible app on there as well. And Amos can be tricky to find. It's tucked away at the back of the Old Testament, and the book is relatively thin, so you might skim over it. So feel free to use your contents page. Top tip, if you've hit the New Testament, you've gone too far. And at the beginning of chapter 3, we see this first call to attention. Amos writes, Hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you. Then, very briefly in verses 3 through 8, he goes on to ask a series of rhetorical questions about cause and effect. His goal is to justify why he is prophesying. The cause is that God has spoken a judgment. And the effect that has to happen in result is that God's prophet must speak God's word to the people. Then we get his accusation against Israel in verses 9 through 10. Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt. Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord who store up in their fortresses what they have plundered and looted. God is highlighting the great unrest and the oppression that's taking place in the midst of his own people, this people that were meant to be holy and different from everyone else. He's pointing out all the wealth that the Israelites have plundered and and looted through exploiting others. In the judgment poem against Israel in chapter 2 that we looked at last week, we were told that they sold innocent people for silver, that they sold needy people to get a new pair of shoes. They trampled on the heads of the poor and they denied justice to those who were oppressed. And it's all summed up in that phrase in verse 10, they do not know how to do right. Even those pagan nations mentioned in verse 9, Ashdod of the Philistines and the Egyptians as well, those pagan nations are called to judge and they are meant to be shocked and appalled by, their, by the behavior of these Israelites to their fellow countrymen. God's accusation continues into the beginning of the next chapter. Look at Amos chapter 4 verse 1. Again, this call to attention. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. And say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. And skip down to verse 4. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. So again, this second judgment speech begins with the call to hear this word. But this time, instead of it being addressed to all the people of Israel, it was specifically addressed to a group who are affectionately called the cows of Bashan. And this is a sarcastic term of scorn referring to the women of high social standing in the capital, capital city of Samaria. And this wouldn't be insulting in the same way as calling a woman a cow in our day would be insulting. Bashan was a lush area on the east of the Jordan where the finest cattle used to be raised. The cattle were well fed and well taken care of. As far as cows go, they lived a life of luxury. And so these women are being accused of living a life of luxury where they're taking care of so they don't have to lift a finger. The comment is less on their weight, though they may have been well fed in their life of luxury, but it's more a rebuke of their laziness. And to achieve this luxurious lifestyle, they've oppressed the poor and crushed the needy. The same accusations we've seen throughout chapters 2 and 3 already. Now, it's not that God is saying only these women commit these sins, but these women are indicative of the attitude and behavior of the whole nation. And it's not just their behavior toward the needy and oppressed that is wrong. In fact, that's just the symptom of a much deeper disease. Look again at verse 4. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Now, if we use our fifth tool from Mining the Prophets, that's going to be helpful to us here. The tool is look for keywords. And this tool is especially helpful whenever you find a place name or a person's name in particular. 
And because those names are often filled with historical meaning that people of that culture would understand, but we might not get. For example, if you were to go to, on a business trip to England, and you were about to give a speech, and you were nervous because you said to someone, I'm about to give my own Gettysburg-level speech, most people have no idea what you're talking about. But to Americans, the word Gettysburg, especially when used in the context of a speech or an address, is pregnant with meaning. So if you were to look up these two place names, Bethel and Gilgal, you would get a whole heap of Israelite history. You may remember the name Gilgal from our series earlier this year in Judges or last year in Joshua. Gilgal was the region where the Israelites first set up camp after crossing the River Jordan into the Promised Land. They set up the 12 stones there, but over the years, it had become a place of idol worship where the Israelites would worship false gods. And Bethel is also a significant place. It's famously where Jacob, when fleeing from his brother Esau, slept one night with his head on a rock as a pillow and had his dream of a stairway to heaven. He named that place Bethel, which means the house of God. And throughout the years, that place had special meaning to the people of Israel. But when the nation split into the two kingdoms of the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, the first king of Israel, King Jeroboam I, set up these altars and created some golden calves for the people to worship at Bethel so that the people wouldn't travel back to the land of Judah to worship in Jerusalem. And so both Bethel and Gilgal were places which spoke of God's work in their nation's history, but have both been turned into centers of idol worship. And so God sarcastically says to them, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. He's mocking their false worship, their sacrifices and tithes and offering in which they boasted, which they thought would give them favor with God but which were ultimately worship of a false god. And I think that the link that Amos wants us to see, which we'll see throughout this book, is that their oppression and cruelty to others is a result of their worship and idolatry. Their treatment of other people is only a symptom of the deeper disease of idolatry. In other words, wrong worship of God leads to wrong treatment of others. Wrong worship of God leads to wrong treatment of others. And this is the cause of God's judgment. It's this disease of idolatry that leads to a wrong treatment of other people. And it could be seen everywhere, all over the nation of Israel. It's not purely an Amos thing either. In fact, I think you could trace this theme throughout the entire Bible. But I think it's summed up best by Jesus himself. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What is the number one rule we are to follow as God's people? This was his response from Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is saying that there is an undeniable link between our love for God and our love for others. In fact, I think Jesus is saying that the level of our love for God is most demonstrated in our level of love for others. Our love for God isn't most clearly expressed in the number of church services we attend or how loudly we sing or the number of days we do our chair time or the percentage of income we tithe or any such religious activity, even though all of those are good things and can help us love God more. Our love for God is most clearly expressed in how we love those around us, how we love our neighbor as ourselves. And so one of the best ways for us to diagnose how well we're loving God is to see how we treat others. And if we're seeing any particular behavioral symptoms in our lack of love for others, they are indicators of where our worship of God is out of line. At its core, every sin issue is ultimately a worship issue. 
That's why when God gave the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments say, do not worship any other God and do not make any idols. We cannot break any commandment without first committing the sin of idolatry to something. So before we move on, I'm going to give you a moment of silence to reflect about your life and your relationships. What patterns of behavior do you see towards certain people? Start close to home. How do you treat your husband or your wife? How do you treat your kids? If you're young, how are you treating your parents? What about extended family members or colleagues at work? I want you to think through these relationships. And if anything comes to your mind, write it down. Take a moment to do that now. Now remember that these are only symptoms, not the root disease. But if you notice some area where you're not loving someone else well, then spend some time reflecting and repenting and asking God to show you where you're not worshiping Him rightly. So our treatment of others is directly linked to our worship of God. And where we're not treating others right, we are not worshiping God rightly. This is the symptom and the disease. And this was the cause of God's coming judgment in the days of Amos. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there are, we're going to look at two different types of God's judgment that are spelled out in these next two chapters, chapters 3 and 4. So let's look at chapter 3 first. And we'll see our second point, that the final judgment of God is final. The final judgment of God is final. And I'll read uh, Amos 3, 11 through 15. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. Hear this and testify against the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. So we can see the finality of God's judgment. An enemy is going to overrun their land and destroy their strongholds and fortresses. We see the use of poetry to create sarcasm in verse 12. The Israelites are going to be rescued just as much as a sheep is rescued from a lion's mouth. The point is that the only thing left will be scraps. Only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. That will be the only evidence that is left of their life of luxury. God is going to completely destroy their worship, specifically the altars at Bethel. And their luxurious homes, their winter home and summer home will be torn down. The final judgment of God will be final. There's no coming back from it. It's kind of like how I treat certain plants in my vegetable garden. There is, or should I say there was, a tomato plant growing in my garden that just wasn't growing at all. And so I've gone through a process of passing judgments on it. 
I assessed if the drip line was watering correctly, and it was. I've tried adding nutrients to the soil. I've checked for bugs and diseases and sprayed some bug deterrent in case I missed anything. I've even planted a couple of spare plants that I had right next to it to check if the soil was okay to see if those other plants would grow fine, and they're growing fine. So there's just something wrong with this tomato plant that's causing it not to grow. And so this weekend, I passed final judgment on it. I pulled it out of the ground and added it to my compost pile. And this final judgment was final. There is no coming back from it. Even if I wanted to dig this plant out of my compost pile and try and replant it, it wouldn't live. There is no chance of life for this plant anymore. And the same was true for the Israelites. When God passes this final judgment of sending the enemy to attack them, there will be no coming back. They will be utterly destroyed, and so that life will be impossible. And when Amos says that this enemy is going to overrun their land, this isn't some uh, prophetic future that he's predicting. He's only describing exactly what God's covenant describes because he's a covenant commentator. If you look back at Deuteronomy 28, where the blessings and the curses of the covenant are listed, you will find a long list of both, and toward the end of the list of curses, you'll see this in Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine or olive oil, nor any cows of your herds or lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. For Amos, this is the inevitable next step of God's judgment. As we'll see in Amos 4, a lot of the other curses mentioned in Deuteronomy 28 haven't worked out to bring the Israelites back to God. And so the next thing to happen is for God to raise up a nation against them. And we know from history that around 25 years after Amos preached to the people, The Assyrian Empire from the north moved south, swept through the land, and the nation of Israel was no more. You hear about the lost tribes of Israel. That's because the ten tribes that formed the northern kingdom of Israel never returned. The final judgment of God was final. Now, if we only had chapter 3... This could lead someone to say, this punishment is too harsh. It seems really unfair. Where was the warning? Well, that question is answered in chapter 4 with our second type of God's judgment. And that is that the partial judgment of God is purposeful. It's our third point. The partial judgment of God is purposeful. So let me read to you these verses from Amos 4. And I want you to hear the repeated phrase in them. This is Amos 4, 6 through 11. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens in vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Did you spot the repeated phrase among all those judgments? Yet you have not returned to me. Now I'm calling these judgments partial judgments because they are not full and final judgments. They're only part judgments. They don't completely destroy the people, but they definitely cause them some problems. 
the hunger, the lack of rain, the destroyed crops, the diseases, the raiders, these were all partial judgments because they didn't completely destroy the people like God's final judgment will. And again, these things are all listed in the covenant curses of Deuteronomy 28. I, don't, I won't read those to you, but if you want to look them up in your own study time this week, you can find them in Deuteronomy 28, verses 22 through 27. That's Deuteronomy 28, verses 22 through 27. But again, Amos is fulfilling his role as a covenant commentator here. He's saying, do you remember all those things that have happened to us over the last months and years? They have happened because we've broken the covenant. But these judgments aren't flashes of God's anger or annoyance. These partial judgments are purposeful. And we can see that purpose in that repeated phrase, yet you have not returned to me. The purpose of these partial judgments was to wake the Israelites up from their sinful stupor. It was meant to pull the rug out from under their feet so they would stop chasing their worthless idols and return to God and hold fast to Him. So in this light, these judgments of God are still judgments, but they're also acts of mercy. They are blessings if you see them in the right light. This is the same reason parents are called on by God to discipline their kids. Some discipline can feel like suffering, especially to a kid. I remember when I was a kid, my sister and I would bicker awfully, especially on summer breaks, we'd just be at each other all day. And my dad would get home from work and my mom would just be exhausted and done for the day. And so my parents came up with punishment called the timetable. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, and when the bickering got to a certain level, my mom would institute the timetable, and one of us would be sent to play upstairs by ourselves. The other one would have to stay downstairs and play by themselves. And then after 30 minutes, we would be required to switch locations, still not playing with each other. And my sister and I hated timetables so much that the mere threat of it would become enough to help us stop bickering. The suffering of not being able to play together taught us to cherish time together. Now, we didn't stop bickering altogether, but it definitely decreased. And with God, He could have let the Israelites continue in their sin and idolatry. He could have not given them prophets. He could have not given them consequences. And they would have ended up facing the final judgment of God only. But in His grace, God was willing to let them suffer for a little while in order to wake them up and call them back to Himself. As C.S. Lewis once wrote, suffering is God's megaphone to a deaf world. God's desire is that his people would return to him before the final judgment. And so he's willing to allow these partial judgments for the purpose of drawing us to himself. The worst thing that God could do for us is to leave us wallowing in our sin, handing us over to our own sinful devices and leaving us to the coming final judgment. But the partial judgment of God is purposeful. This is the side of judgment that we so often miss and that the world misses altogether. Because if we focus solely on the idea of judgment, we only picture the final judgment of God. But when we put God's judgment in the context of His other characteristics, that His judgment is a merciful judgment and a loving judgment, we can see that the partial judgment of God is purposeful. But it can be hard to see that in the midst of our own lives. We often ask the question, why are these things happening to me? You might be having financial struggles. Your budget may be all out of whack. You might be having relational struggles. Your marriage or your relationship with your kids is rocky. Your work situation may be far from desirous, or your kid may be experiencing some hard times and it just breaks your heart. And we ask the question, why are these things happening to me? Well, here's today's key takeaway that I want us to focus on. God may be using the circumstances in your life to draw you to Him before the final judgment. 
God may be using the circumstances in your life to draw you to him before the final judgment. And I want to highlight the word may, that second word may. We need to apply wisdom and counsel from others before jumping to too many conclusions. God may be allowing you a season of suffering in some aspect of your life in order to draw you back to him. But there are plenty of people who are walking with God who go through times of suffering too, none more so than Jesus. He was a man familiar with suffering. But we should always be aware of what God is doing in our lives. Maybe God is using your life situations in order that you would return to him and cling to him more closely. When tough times come in our lives, it can be tempting to pray them away. God, please stop this situation from happening to me. But these may be the very things that God is using to draw you to himself. It's kind of like when you're sick and you're asking God to remove the symptoms only, like the runny nose or the cough. But those are the things designed by God to get the disease out of your body. And so when we face these tough situations in our lives, or when we experience some of those broken relationship symptoms that we spoke of earlier, instead of asking God to take these away, we should be asking what the root problem is. For example, some people notice a lot of conflict in their lives. And they ask God to provide them with patience. And they ask others to pray that their patience would grow. But often the problem isn't a lack of patience. The problem is that you're desiring something, idolizing something that the other person is preventing you from getting, so you get impatient. Like when I get impatient with my kids because they're fighting, instead of me asking you guys to pray for patience, I need to ask the question, what is causing me to get impatient? In my case, it's that I'd rather be sitting on the couch relaxing rather than getting up like I did five minutes ago, going down the hall and doing the hard, repetitive work of training my kids how not to fight, but how to have good conversations instead. I don't need more patience. I need to love my kids more than I love my couch. If you struggle with anger toward people at work, you could get some anger management strategies to help you, but you're only treating the symptoms. What you need to do is see your anger as a symptom of a deeper disease and see the relational situation as one of God's purposeful judgments. God doesn't want you worshiping false idols, that when they get threatened, we get angry. Instead, he wants you to worship him alone and rely on him alone. And so rooting out the idol behind your anger, repenting of it, and reminding yourself of the gospel truth that counters that anger is the true way to overcome it in God's strength. And so God may be using the circumstances of your life to draw you to him before the final judgment. This isn't something we figure out quickly. It takes personal time. It takes personal reflection. It takes conversing with other believers. But rather than distracting ourselves by binging some TV or by glaring at our t phone screens, we can experience some true change in our lives if we use these circumstances of our lives to turn to our great king and cling to him more. I'm going to pray, but I want to remind you that we are available. If you're convicted this morning or aware this morning that there's some stuff going on in your life and you might be realizing that's indicative of something deeper, we would love to talk to you about that. That's what we're here for. We would love to speak with you, so feel free to grab us after a service. Feel free to reach out to us during the week. We would love to talk about those things and we can share with you how messed up we are as well because we're all in this together. But let me pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we get to read it, open it, and hear that your spirit still speaks to us through your word. And Father, we praise you that you are powerful yet merciful, that you uh, can bring those partial judgments into our lives. And even though they hurt, Father, we can see their purpose. And Father, I thank you that you bring them so that we don't just face your final judgment on that terrible day. 
And so, Father, I pray that we would see clearly what's going on in our lives, that we won't just look at the surface symptoms of our circumstances, but we would look deeper. We would see the root, and that your Spirit would help us to see the root of those issues in our lives. Father, I pray especially for those here this morning who um, are far from you, that they may be here this morning just wondering what they're doing, why they're bothering again. But I pray, Father, that you would be speaking to them this morning by your Spirit through your Word, that they would see the circumstances in their life, see that it brought them here today to hear your Word, and they would return to you, Father, and draw closer to you as we all would. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.